Let's not stand on ceremony here. Welcome to the official Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast. My name's Ian. And my name's Nikki, bringing you the best in comics and graphic novels and updates from the festival. Hello and welcome to Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast, episode 21. My name's Ian. And I'm Nikki. Every week I get that right. It's brilliant, isn't it? (laughs) It's the way you kind of like, you really concentrate on getting the words out. Well, I've got to. Uh Uh-huh. Got to get it right every time. Every time. A recognised opening is... Is that what it is? is you could always, you know, of the show. record it and just play it. What? And, and then, then just, just go, change number. 21! 22! <laughs> yeah, 21! <laughs> or I could just be as perfect as I am and say it right every time, first time, every time. Oh, at least you're perfect in something. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Okay. Um... A few bits to talk about before we review some books. We've got Pete Taylor on the show later on. Oh, I love Pete. How to create a comic. Yes. I was making notes. Where are your notes now? I'm no, uh, Do you know, I'm looking for them now. I'm looking at the table and I don't know when... Where, what did you do with my notes? I've not touched your notes. Oh, I'm going to have to listen again. Well, there you go. It's not so bad. Nope. So yeah, have a listen and uh, feedback to us. Mm. Any thoughts? Um, Any and advice? Then, yeah. We'll talk about that after this yep. bit anyway. Yeah. First thing, a few news, a few bits to talk about. Go Down on. the Tube's website. Oh, yes. The website ran, run, well, not ran, run by John Freeman. Yes. Um, it's 20 years old in October. That's good going. That's older than me. It's really not older than you, it's is it? It's not older than me. No, it's only half your age. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Not quite. Eh, near enough. Not quite. Near enough. But still, for a website, that's pretty damn good going. Yep. For the interwebs. Interwebs. It's only been around like 21 years. I was going to say, it must have been there at the beginning. Well, almost. Carved out of Google. So, it's October. Mm-hmm. So, I think we need to buy John. We can buy him a present. A pint. <gasps> we could buy him a cake. We'll just buy him a pint. I'm going to buy him a cake. Pint. He can have a pint and a cake. Pint and a cake. There you go. <laughs> so. From Greg's. <laughs> A donut. He needs a cake. He actually does actually need a proper he cake. He does need cool. a proper cake. We'll we'll talk to people. Okay. And Greg's probably be again. very <laughs> unsuccessful. But anyway. Yeah, so if you've never looked at it, go and look at it. Mm. I've got a review on there. Well, apart from that, it's a treasure trove yeah. of information. <laughs> but there is. Every day there is news pops up there about British comics. Yeah. Every single day. Um loads of stuff goes on it. So yeah, check it out. Mm-hmm. Down the tubes dot net i'm thinking you did look a little panicked then yes <laughs> as you looked at me and i'm thinking haven't got my phone haven't got the internet on me i can't check <laughs> go and have a look at it um i will check that go on as we talk about the next segment. go on then try um, and do two things at once go and show them that men can multitask a <laughs> couple of trailers have come out uh-huh ant-man and wasp and the wasp and the wasp sorry Get it right. what did you think um see i enjoyed ant-man that was a good film. Down the tubes.net. Done. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed Ant Man. It was a surprise hit considering the superhero skills. It it fell into that kind of jolly happy. It tried to be kind of naughty ish in the humour, but it stayed family friendly, didn't it? Well, it should have been Edgar Wright, and then he was sort of kicked off. Yeah. Which would have been a much more. More grown up one. Interesting. <laughs> So I enjoyed it. Um, it looks okay. It looks in yeah. the same vein, really. Um, it, does. it will be all right. It won't be up there on your top list of of superhero films for the no. year, but well, it will be all right. There's not that many. I will say there's not that many. Yeah, but it won't six, be your top seven. five, will it? Well, it probably will because no. there's not that many. No, it won't. There's four Marvel. There's a couple of DC, and they're not going to be in the top five. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> you have got Black Panther out next Blank week. Panther. Black Panther. Black. Is that when he... <laughs> there was no one there. It was a complete blank. blank. <laughs> Who's here to save us? No. I don't... I can hear purring. Maybe it's a cat. <laughs> no, nothing. It's getting amazing preview reviews. Preview That's reviews, good. Sort of, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, now, a lot of those people have been given free tickets and stuff, so they're going to be... They're, they're hyped Marvel fans, but still, mm. people are loving it. Yeah. So hopefully it's as good as it it sounds it's going to be. 
That's okay because it didn't. The character itself doesn't actually interest me that much. That's terrible, isn't it? Well, no, I, because you don't know anything it, of it. No, I don't have enough of the. We're going to get to a point in a minute of something else we're going to talk about, Ooh. which you weren't interested. Um, <laughs> interested in. Just rubbing and your nose not, in this one now, Nicole. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Before we do, yes, go. On. I kill giants. Yes, it's just a statement. <laughs> But you don't. I don't see the bunny ears. No. Okay. Uh, so the trailer for that came out. Mm. I was, we, we first heard about this at the Lakes Festival two years ago. Yes. Not the last one, the one before. Mm-hmm. We knew nothing of the comic or anything. And to be fair, we've not read the comic yet. It's in no, our list to read. It is. Um, but yeah. What do you think of the trailer? It was interesting. It didn't show enough where you go, no, oh, well, I know the story. Um, it It gave enough. To make you go, oh hello, what's this? Things that it make looks- you go. Mm. Mm. Um, so I think it's one I'd like to go and see because it's got it some, intrigues. Some me. names in there as well. I don't care about names. Um, well, I care about the story. The money behind it, which from a comic based. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It just means they paid money for a star. They're putting it money behind no, it. No. Oh my god. No, I'm sorry. Well, obviously, looking at the effects, they have put money behind it. Yeah, I mean the effects look amazing. <laughs> um, so that looks really interesting. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm glad. That they have put some money behind it was the point I was making. It's not oh, just okay. an indie film. Yeah, they've got some stars there. That means they're, they're making the effort. They yeah, want but I something want to, out of it. Hopefully, it does keep that indie film feel to yeah. it because that will make it more plausible, all round, and plausible <laughs> giants. <laughs> no, as in it will stay closer to the main source, which okay. is the, the which comic. we need to read before yeah. it comes out. Yes, because yeah, it's interesting. We, we, we're doing a planning a series out. We're talking about comics. Mm. And, and and movies and we've been watching the movies before the comics i feel it's a big mistake yes definitely a big mistake um yeah the thing we're going to talk about go on that's just like black panther black lightning <laughs> right you weren't interested in that when i said let's watch the first episode that just come out in netflix do you know i wasn't interested in it at all i just thought because you went it's done by the same people who did flash and you know i hate flash well, it's done by the same it's not done by the same people it's done by the same company cw so, yeah. yeah. Well, that instantly, because I find all that quite pithy, I do apologise <laughs> to all the Flash fans and Supergirl fans out there, but I do find it all a bit, uh, a bit soap opery and uh, that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that. But actually, it, I was pleasantly surprised and I thoroughly enjoyed the first one. Um, yeah. Again, Black quite- a smaller character in the DC world. Um, mm. Again, I've never... I probably have read him in Justice League books, but I've never sort of come across him properly. I don't know anything about him. I don't know anything about him. As a him. character. They started the series off down the line in his life where he's basically yeah, given he's up. Done, yeah, he's given it up for, like nine for family. Years, I think it was. Something like that, wasn't it? He's got two grown-up teenage daughters. Yeah, um, oh, they're pains. <laughs> his wife oh. has moved out because, because of his role yep. as Black Lightning. He's now the headmaster of a school. Yes. Um, and he's But the, the whole... Place is overrun. It's it? it's centre of black culture essentially, with gangs and violence all around this small uh-huh. area wherever they lives. Mm. It's it's in the heart of the, the a black area in America. And, that's yes. that, and it's yeah. sort of representing that culture of downtrodden yeah. people in this society where they're just well, having to live these, the way they feel the they need to live. Get, yeah, yeah, just roll over them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he was in the past the person that stopped all this. Yeah. Obviously, he gave up but, for his personal reasons because he, he's not invulnerable. He's just a guy with powers. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. He's not. He's not. He can shoot electricity. That's awesome and has glowy eyes. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> I literally want that. <laughs> and it's just, and what I was concerned about when I first put it on is, is this going to be a whole series of him becoming Black Lightning again? Oh, uh, yeah. And dragging it on. But no. No. The no, first just... season, he's back to Black Lightning, kicks off. But don't you think happen. this is kind of following in on a bit like Jessica Jones and Luke Cage? They've taken people further on in their careers. Mm-hmm. And they use more mature people, old people, <laughs> um, people my age. And I think that's a lot better. It's much more believable. It's much more mm-hmm. grounded. I like that. I like the way that they've kind of gone with this. The guy who went for Black Lightning went for Luke Cage. He's got an amazing but voice. But didn't, didn't get the role. It's like, oh, carry on talking. <laughs> and all he wanted to be was this superhero. It's, that's what he would do. He wanted to be a superhero. I can see him as Luke Cage as well. Well, yeah. yeah it's massive. He's, 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 he's a, like six foot five, I think he's, he is. He's a tall man. Yeah. Mm. So it's out weekly as opposed to bulk. It's on Netflix, but it's, it's a weekly I like, release. See, I like Netflix doing weekly things because yeah. it, it means you, 
you can obviously wait and then binge watch the lot. But I kind of like the anticipation because I'm watching Korean Odyssey as well. And that's a weekly one. And it's like, oh, it's Friday. Oh, that's not My next there. episode's coming out. I love Korean Odyssey. Okay, Don't even go yes, there. Yes, dear. So worth watch. Definitely mm. worth watch. Even if you're not a fan of... It's probably is more like the you say the Marvel. It's more realism, realistic. Mm. Than Jessica Jones. Oh yeah, so I know it's DC. I wasn't. But it's got a bit of a kind of. It has got a bit of cheese to it as well with the uniform. So it's uniforms, bro. <laughs> so it's a cross in a way between yes, Flash it, and and Luke Cage and Jessica Jones. It's nothing to do with Flash. It's, it's a cross, cross. No, no, it's 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 more. It's definitely more mature. There may not be a crossover show either because they Good. film in completely different locations. Good. Well, I don't no, want a crossover. No, I don't know. Join in there. No, you see that. Just makes Black it Lightning awful could throw as well. In the flash could spin around and fire it off Please, somewhere. please stop. Because there is some. There's a writer somewhere going. This is an amazing idea. We must do this. And no, no, no. just okay. leave it alone. It's got integrity. Don't don't mess it up with the flash. <laughs> Shall we uh, review some books? Go on then. I'll let you go first, my dear. So we're going to actually do what different ones each this time because we've uh, only read different ones each. We've not read the same books this time. Ah. So you before there's a little story behind it. Go on. Um, we got a, set, a selection of books off Judy Tate, the festival director. We did. Because she went over to Japan. She did. She bought me Studio Ghibli badges. Badge and stuff. <gasps> yes. So this is one of those books which we will be talking about. The others, there's certainly a couple that we need to talk about together because they're quite mm. similar in themes and, and, and so forth. Mm. Um, but this is very separate to that. So I'll let you talk about this. It's a tiny little square book, which I love. What's it called? It's called Square. <laughs> and it, it is by Ian M. Me? No. Not you, no. funnily enough. And this is right, the little blurb on the back. For the summer of 2017, I decided to make a diary comic for each day. This collects 92 j- days from June to August in to September of 2018. Well, not them, but anyway. So, yes, it's a little, it's incredibly cute in a way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds bad, doesn't it? We say so, it's always ever so cute. Well, when you're coming from Japan, yes, because you now you're just imagining little unicorns or little things like that. Yeah, no, it's not I don't know why I went Irish. But I don't know. Um, it's just this guy. It is literally a snapshot moment of each day of just normal things. But there's like some real poignant poignant ones so when he can't get to sleep and he's just lying there and he's, he put, turns his pillow over to the other side and then he looks at his phone it's 3.30 and that's it that, that's but all. we've all been there yeah exactly Definitely all been there. you can relate with him um, on so many things he's got his daughter in quite a lot of these and just their little relationship and their little just talking he goes to the shop to try and find some food he gets you know it's just things like that I mean obviously he lives in Japan he does go over to Canada um and then you see a difference between the two countries, you know, the more serene Japan, the more, I don't, not clean, that's probably the wrong word. Um, I'd say Canada, you feel is quite clean. Well, yes, yeah, you'd way. assume Canada is quite a lovely place to be. Mm-hmm. But when you compare it with Japan and how he's done it in here, then Canada was almost like a Wild West type okay. type thing. So it was a lot, a complete difference. He's been living in, in Japan for 14 years, so... He's, you know, he's, there's a difference between the two, mm-hmm. but no, it, it's, I love it. It's, it's like, <laughs> this is going to sound weird. So it's like peeking into the window of his life, just at these little points. And it's like big brother. All right. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> just doing that. And then, then you go away again and then you okay. come back and he's written another little one. And it, okay. yeah, it's just four panels and they're just, just lovely for each day. So that's Square. 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 But no, I really enjoyed it. It it doesn't have a story, it doesn't have a plot. It is just snapshots in someone's mm-hmm. life. Mine's complete opposite. Yes, yours is. The Smell of Starving Boys oh. by <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's just the name. <laughs> Frederick Peters and Lu Hui pa- Fang. Pang. Lu Hui Pang. Don't shake your head. <laughs> Don't shake your head. Um I'll just read a bit of blurb. I'll do it in my best movie voice. Go on, use your movie voice. Texas, 1872. With the Civil War over, exploration has resumed in the territories to the west of Mississippi. The geologist Stingley is looking to capitalise. Together with photographer Oscar Forrest, who catalogues the terrain, and their young assistant Milton, Stingley strikes out into territory that might one day support a new civilization. Do you like that? Was um, I'd say the but word. But this is no. Oh version God! It carries on. <laughs> as a frontiersman movie, West 
Move west. It becomes clear that the expedition won't go unchallenged. <gasps> Stingley has led them into a hostile region, the native Comanche's last bastion of resistance. In a spectacular landscape, under the looming threat of attack, the boundaries between the civilized and natural worlds dissolve. Ooh. So, that is 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 basically the the, the story. Is that the story? So you. I wasn't got, listening, by the way, because oh, you. It was just the way your voice went. <laughs> So essentially, Stingley has, has, has taken photographer Oscar Forrest to, to take pictures of the landscape mm-hmm. so he can plan to build whatever he's decided to build. Okay. Um, kick out the last of the Indians that are hanging <laughs> out. That right, there. wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. For that time. Um, which Stingley isn't aware of this, this story mm. that's going on. Um, and he's also got the young assistant Milton there mm-hmm. to help out. And it's, it's a story of the relationship between um oscar and milton mm-hmm. first and foremost and how that develops throughout the story mm-hmm. but also that relationship of, of people and the land so the indians and land and, and the white men mm-hmm. and the land and and how how we just destroy it in some ways i suppose it yeah. feels like it comes across well, that's what happened um well it, yeah yeah that's it isn't it and it, it feels like it's the land fighting back yeah throughout the story and i think there's a lot of things when you read the story you can take from it because mm. it has a lot of metaphors and a lot of trying to trying to give you what you the ideas of what it's trying to oh, I can't explain that very well i know it's, I, it's hard it's isn't hard it with that, to, to explain it it's trying to give you a lot more mm. than, than the basic storyline that's there um the art is gorgeous mm. i mean the book that when it arrived oh it's it's something different i, I was that. like wow well it's, it's the fact i think that the dust cover um, is a different size than the actual book, so you get their names of the the writer and the artist on the top. So what an A three hardback book is gorgeous. I hope it's not A three. Is it not A three? Really big to try. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> well, it's quite big. Um, and and the art is full color. It's gorgeous all the way through. Mm. Um, I recommend you go and grab this. Yeah, it is an enjoyable, a very enjoyable book. Uh, of course, self-made hero. Uh-huh. We love their stuff. We do. It's always going to be. Yeah. Go and check it out. Smell of starving boys and square. square. Two completely different <laughs> books there, and completely different sizes. <laughs> yes, you can fit. How many squares? <laughs> How many book? squares of square can you fit in the smell you of starving boys? Two and a half squares onto a, that. That's impressive. That is impressive. So now we have a chat with uh, Pete, Pete mm. Taylor. He's never been on the show before. God, who's Pete? Who's Pete Taylor? <laughs> Talking about how to create a comic mm-hmm. and how to promote the comic as well. Yes. Mm. Mike's mutterings. Hello and welcome again. This episode I will once again be looking at comics adapted from TV series. And this is a TV show that is very close to my heart, Sons of Anarchy. So, for the uninitiated, what or who are the Sons of Anarchy? Well, the TV series ran for seven seasons between 2008 and 2014. It was the brainchild of writer Kurt Sutter, and it followed the trials and tribulations of a motorcycle club through the eyes of their heir apparent, Jax Teller. The club was originally founded by Jax's father, John, and fellow Vietnam War veterans with a view to live an outlaw lifestyle and achieve a sense of freedom with their lives. The club grows, spawning many chapters across Southern California, but the series really remains central around the founding chapter Sam Crow, which is the Sons of Anarchy Motorcycle Club Redwood Original. Fast forward to today, and it follows John's death that the club is now run by club president Clay Morrow, the now stepfather to Jax. Heavily involved in running guns for the IRA and numerous other criminal enterprises, the club is in a spiral of violence and death. Jax soon discovers a journal from his dead father that reveals that the club has moved far too away from what their founding vision was and that he had planned to actually get them out of guns and into a more legitimate enterprises. The seven-season story arc is quite epic in scale, with Jack struggling for control of Sam Crow with his stepfather. 
He constantly battles guilt and the need for redemption throughout what can only be described as a Shakespearean tragedy. In fact, the Hamlet references really can't be ignored. The dead father talking to his son, uh, not as a ghost but through the journal, even episode titles reference it. So what do I actually love about this series? Well, here's a quick list. First, the plot was gripping. The characters felt real, and despite some of the truly awful acts they perpetrate, you still root for them. There's a very real feeling of family. The realism of the biker gang structures and politics, the wider criminal world of city drug gangs, Mexican cartels and white supremacists. And there's the two levels of story, one of action and drama, the second of themes, motives and spiritual journey. And this is all the things that I want to see in a comic series. I actually watched the final episode, having watched the entire series, from scratch, only a couple of weeks ago. And it's actually on the special features of that final disc that you actually learn that creator Kurt Sutter really wanted to explore different ways of showing his universe off, and specifically mentions both a comic project and a computer game project. The first Sons of Anarchy comic title came out in 2013, from Boom Studios. Initially written by Christopher Golden, a veteran of TV adaptations, and was previously praised heavily for his work on Buffy. The first story arc is very Tig-centric. Now, this is a brave choice, as the character Tig is a very challenging one to start with, whilst redeeming qualities are shown throughout the series occasionally, he is, in essence, a very, very bad man. The comics excel at making it clear where in the series timeline events are occurring, and the first arc actually runs parallel to season 5, and it accomplishes something that many TV adaptation comics really fail at. It actually enhances the TV viewing experience. Now this plot involves the daughter of a dead SOA member coming to the club for help, leading to a moral quandary because for various reasons they have a choice to make between helping or killing. Making Tig centric to this plot is a very clever way of tackling it because of Tig's previous experiences in the series with his own two daughters. No spoilers here. It's a very strong start to the comic series. Artist Damien Cusiero has a lovely style and excellent at capturing on-screen likenesses. There's great use of shadows and the inking and colouring is gorgeous. Ed Brisson soon takes over writing duties with all the same attention to detail and wit. Matthias Bagara takes over as artist roughly about halfway through the series and the script and art quality remains high throughout. As the series continues to a total of 25 issues, it has both one-shots and story arcs of varying length. The breathing space that comics can give you allows for greater in-depth exploration of different key SOA characters. One I, I did like actually was ex Marshal Torrick gets some limelight. He's probably one of the most disturbed characters that Grace Sam Crow's story. Really glad that Gemma and Tara also get the attention they deserve. Not only strong female characters, they are actually the strongest of all characters in the series, I think, in terms of determination and grit. Gemma, the matriarch of the club, has the biggest effect on the series, more than anyone else with her dangerous Machiavellian plotting, and Tara, Jax's wife, or old lady, is probably the closest anyone came to actually ending Gemma's scheming. Uh, well, until... Uh, again, no spoilers. It was really nice to end with one of the nicest, more moral and loyal characters, the club member Opie. His story, set between series 1 and 2, is a strong finish for this, and manages to merge both TV and comics so seamlessly. A new series began in 2016 under the title Sons of Anarchy Redwood Original. Now this goes back in time to tell Jax's story from his first year when he starts as a prospect for the club. I'll explain. Members must complete a year of being a prospect before it's decided by vote whether they make full membership and get a seat around the table where all club matters are voted on. This is his journey uh, basically to earn his cut, which is the name given to the distinctive leather that members proudly wear, uh, and also this displays their club logo, the Grim Reaper. At this point he's fresh out of school, and it revolves a lot around his close relationship with his best friend Opie. 
Joining his dead father's club that's being run by his new stepfather is a big decision. And these years really go on to shape him, um, his drive and his ambition for Sam Crow uh, later on that's explored in the series. This was closely supervised by series creator Kurt Sutter, and that's basically to ensure that all of it is within Sam Crow canon. But this isn't just about the development of the young Jacks. Younger versions of Gemma, Clay, Opie, Chibs, all the main characters feature heavily. Ollie Masters is the writer, while artist Luca Pizzari brings a familiar style. I must admit, I'm still way behind on this. It's only a 12-issue run, and I'm still at issue 4. Um, and I do know that Owen Marin takes over as artist, and I really haven't seen his work yet. Uh, but they have been kind of picking artists that have uh, a very similar style and look, uh, and all seem to be pretty expert at getting those character features just spot on. I would have liked to actually collected all of these as single issues, uh, but I was actually lent most of them, and I'm probably going to be left with having to buy the collected trade volumes, which is a shame because, like I said, the, some of the individual cover issues were absolutely stunning. In summary, it's a great transition from TV to comics, but it is unapologetic in the way that it assumes knowledge of the show. It wouldn't be easy for someone not acquainted with Sam Crow customs and traditions just to drop into this series and understand what's going on. So if you aren't acquainted with The Reaper, uh, then I suggest that you get the Series 1-7 to box set as soon as possible. I really do rate Sons of Anarchy up there with The Sopranos when it comes to high-end drama. For fans of the show, there is still more to come. Filming on a spin-off series about the Mayan MC started back in 2016. I do know it's been picked up by the networks, and it should appear this year. Kurt Sutter co-wrote with Elgin James, so it should be worth the wait. I'm so excited about this to get a proper look at the Latino MC culture. But the one I've really been waiting for is the Sons of Anarchy prequel. Sutter has spoke at several comic conventions and film conventions telling the story uh, of the origins of the club back in the Vietnam era. We all know he wants to do it, we just don't know when. I'd love for it to start actually during the war so we can actually get to know the origins of John Teller and Piney Winston. All in favour of meeting Mr Mayhem? So, yeah, today is about the basics of creating a comic. Yeah. yeah. So that we can then go on and create a comic. Yeah. So, yeah, what a stupid idea I had. It no, was. You, oh, he just gets bored for like 10 minutes and then I get a load of texts when I get out of work that says, I've had an idea, I've emailed Julie, and I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> what have you done? Pete Taylor's on the show anyway, we're continuing from there because that's funny. <laughs> We've got Pete Taylor on the show, he's never been on before. I do. Not this year. <laughs> well, no, well, he has for his Well, own, yeah, for his yeah. little segment. We were just talking, actually, we're nearly a year since the show's been going. That's mad, isn't it? We've got a month to go and then we're, yeah, I was counting, it's not. Anniversary. Beginning of March. Oh, are you going to buy me a card for anniversary? Why would I buy you a card? Because it's like our anniversary, we need a, a group card. <laughs> group card. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've got Pete on the show. Um, I was saying to talk about how to create a comic. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, if, yeah. How do you no, I'm not going to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll go through the say, steps. Go on, sorry, go on. I've done more books in total for the people than I have for myself. Uh, you know, in, in essence, uh, luckily for me, with my job being uh, a graphic designer and illustrator, I can kind of come at it from both sides, if you like. Yeah. It's, um, it's my bread and butter in terms of putting something together and packaging it for a printer, w- whether it be a leaflet or, a, you know, a poster or a comic, which is essentially, um, you know, a, a larger leaflet in some terms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Multi-page music brochure of art. Yeah. So, you know, in that sense, I, I kind of come from both sides. And having sort of organised a group of creatives whose primary reason for existing was to produce their own comics, I, I know, I think, a lot of the time, 
the areas that people tend to stumble on mm. or just worry about or get, you know, a bit confused by. So hopefully we can we can nail all those things down tonight. It's like our senpai. <laughs> senpai. <laughs> senpai beard. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's start at the basis. So the ideas for a comic. When when you're thinking of a, a story, ideas or plot, what what should you be considering? Is there anything you should consider at that stage, or do you just go for it, let your imagination flow? I think in, in, in purely in terms of the idea, so um, in this in the story terms, then you should only be considering what you want to produce and what you would be interested in reading. Mm-hmm. I think it's fatal to try and come up with the story that you believe everyone else is going to want to read because I don't think you're serving yourself and ultimately you won't end up serving your reader. Mm -hmm. So you should be in story terms coming up with an idea that you're excited about and you want Mm -hmm. to spend the quite considerable considerable amount of time it's going to take to produce it really. So I think, um, that's what you should be considering story-wise. So they make it about me then. Well, it's all about you, dear. <laughs> no, it's not. You make sure it's all about you. <laughs> so then, then that that leads on to writing a script, I suppose. Now you, you've you've done your own comics, haven't you, in regards to writing a script? How have you gone about starting that? What's the process of starting a script in that way? Yeah, it's it's strange because I've worked from other people's scripts, yeah. which are, you know, in terms of a, a standard format, usually um, they look a bit like a screenplay, um, short description of what's going on, followed by uh, dialogue or captions. Um, when I do my own scripts, because I know I'll be drawing them, I tend to kind of do weird little thumbnails alongside the script so i'm thinking of the page visually as i'm putting together the um the the script and the dialogue Mm -hmm. so for me it's um i kind of end up with with some sort of hybrid i can't quite disconnect it when i'm doing it myself but for something like copperopolis um i'm supplied a script from the writers um we we know there's a bit of kind of editing involved and i'll i'll go back and say can we do this or you know can we do that but their script is delivered in a in a standard standard way Mm -hmm. so i kind of do a bit of both in in that sense i mean as a team i mean we haven't organized roles but i kind of know you both so i'm assuming that ian you're gonna be writing it and nikki you're gonna be drawing it what are you saying about my art (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no no what was your words i'll just do the easy bit is yeah what you said Ian. <laughs> come on a script writer can pump out numerous scripts in the time it takes for, for an artist to do one one comic let's be honest um so yeah completely right there <laughs> essentially nick is doing the hard work and my name's going to look nice above it <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i mean uh, as a as a team a team that you will be able <laughs> <laughs> we'll help to confer with each other so I, I i mean you can go that kind of approach that uh we do with the uh the sec really and we we do tend to have meetings sometimes and read it through and you know um you will get you know the chance for the artist to say you know oh i've got you know i've got a good idea of how this could be staged mm. and then sometimes that might um even inspire another part of the story sometimes mm-hmm. as well so you you have got a chance to collaborate even in the early stages so i suppose the point when you when, when the writer's writing they're thinking about the framing what how, um, how do you get to that what what what's the decision on how you're going to lay a comic out i suppose from a writing viewpoint r- yes i think from my point of view um i would prefer for the writer not to tell me the size of the box mm-hmm. And, you know, exactly, you know, sometimes what the camera viewpoint is. Mm. I think um, I, I have had scripts where that happens. And, you know, you will, you'll, you'll try and follow them. But as, as an artist, you might have a completely different way of visualizing it 
and ultimately depicting it that the writer hasn't um, thought of. So I think um, as long as there's a, a spirit of collaboration there, um, also sometimes um, it can stop the flow if you're worried too much about telling the artist, you know, what size box is and how do I s describe that? And I think your job as the writer should be um, getting the the story ideas to make sure they're there, to make sure that your climaxes and your um, your reader is pulled along by you know your characters and the situation, and then you know letting the artist support you know both both sides really I suppose in terms of the storytelling which is the size of the box and making sure the eye is led across the, the page mm -hmm. in comic terms and then the actual you know um, art quality of the letting the eye linger and enjoy the way they've shown that um, action or scene so onto the actual creation I think more than the, the writing where do you start when you're drawing a comic? And that might sound silly because obviously it's easy to, to get a picture and draw a picture, but do you, you probably best ask, sort of ask some of these questions. No, no. You carry on digging your <laughs> hole. <laughs> how, again, talking about the framing, how do you decide as an artist how you're going to frame a page? Do you start, do you decide before you start drawing or do you just. Is this because you know I've it? done the first bit of this comic well, and I've done. just sketched it out? Well, she's. <laughs> well, that was more of a practice, but yeah, we've done a a a, a page essentially, but it's yeah. not a page. It's been done on. We've just done an A four piece of paper, haven't you? Essentially, two paper. Two no, paper. it's in a sketch pad. It's not like yeah. I've just sketched yeah. it out. Yeah, but <laughs> in my mind, as a person who's never created a comic, I would think I would create the boxes on a page and then draw into those boxes. No, you see, I think it's the other way around. So, you? Pete, <coughs> talk yeah. us through it. <laughs> I'm still arguing. Now. <laughs> I think. I think as you as you have both found out over the past year, there is no there is no one way of creating a comic. Mm -hmm. And every artist and writer will probably work a different way. And you know, you can make uh was it Mark Brooks that made um his comic out of crayons and you know uh Gareth Brooks. Gareth Brooks. Gareth Not Brooks. Gareth. I somebody said Gareth Brooks. <laughs> You know, uh, you can be, it can be entirely made out of pencil. It can be painted. Um, you know, I think there was somebody recently who did a kind of um, 3D massive uh, comic that you, in a, in a gallery that you just sort of like, you know, had to literally wrench the, the pages open. Mm -hmm. So you, they, they, it can be really produced anyway. Um, I think the best place... You you need to have some idea of what you want the final thing to be like. So you need to have some idea of the final size, at least, yeah. of your finished comic. Now, a standard US comic is uh, a particular size. I think something like it's 160 by 270, something like that. Um it's quite a strange size um, in this country. Um, it's it, it can be quite expensive to produce um, because of its weird size, and there's a bit of wastage in terms of the of, of how um, the printer prints it. Mm. Which is why a lot of small press um, creators tend to do um, an A5, mm -hmm. which is half of an A4. Okay. Uh, it's a little more closer to a sort of manga size as well. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, if you're drawing um, on an A4 page, then that would naturally shrink to fit an A5 page. And traditionally, you would tend to work larger in your artwork than the finished size. Told you. Because <sighs> Pay, you're not helping that me was that way it just tends to neaten things up it'll we can get hide the detail in as well can't you yeah you just have to kind of weigh that up sometimes i mean um are i still to a certain extent when i've inked my first few pages mm. um i'll scan them in and print them out at the size that i know they're going to be just to weigh up yeah. if it's looking 
how I want to. And it's never going to look exactly the same because, um, you know, a household printer isn't quite going to print it. But mm-hmm. just to be comfy that you're, you're heading that, in that right direction. Mm-hmm. So the artwork, the final artwork size will give you um, the confidence that you're working at the right size. I mean, again, there are, I know there are French artists, I think I was listening to a podcast the other day, that actually work smaller than the final size. Yeah. So tends to be an industry standard, I think, that you do tend to work down, but equally shouldn't let it worry you, you know. But um, that, I think, just for, especially when you, you're starting out, have an idea of what your final size is going to be. That allows you to work your artwork to be something you're comfortable with because you know it's either going to you know shrink or even be redu- uh, shown at the actual size you'll know mm-hmm. um and then um yeah um so yeah so if you've got your script and you've decided that it's going to be a certain size mm-hmm. then the next stage i would imagine is i would tend to do or what uh, most people would do would be what's called thumbnails which is essentially when you take the script which mm-hmm. say the first page has um six panels uh the writer would traditionally write what happens in each of those uh, mm-hmm. boxes with a bit of dialogue and a thumbnail is just a very small uh, diagram of what your first thoughts are going to be what of what's in those boxes mm-hmm. so you're essentially it's the very first time a word is converted or the word of the script is converted into a, the picture in a panel um and that allows you to work uh, i suppose more quickly than you would on a standard page you don't get bogged down necessarily in getting your figure work right it's more about you know if you're going to do um a tight shot on someone's face or you're going to do a long shot of you know a couple of people in the street or you need a long wide panel to set a scene when somebody's just reached the jungle temple you know so all of these things suddenly become um a a more sort of planning sort of page really Mm -hmm. i use thumbnails a lot of the time as well to try and make sure those things that are difficult for um, a writer to um, to work out, like um, that the people in the panel are in the right position, so the word balloons will will work. Mm-hmm. I was you know about I mean? to ask, I'm ask about those. Yeah, yeah. So that I tend to try and work that in the out in the thumbnail. So, for instance, the latest issue of Copperopolis number three happens. And it's a pub quiz. So you've got these very tight panels of sometimes three or four characters sat in a row. Mm -hmm. Now, if the person who is sat furthest right in the panel speaks first, then as a letterer, you've, you've got a bit of a problem or, you know, you need to take that as an artist. You need to sort of think with your lettering head and think, well, how am I going to have that tail going across everybody mm-hmm. and then other people talking. So you might choose to, for instance, flip the scene and you're showing them the people from the back, mm. in which case the person then furthest right would be furthest left. They speak first, so the balloon from them is first. And that's the kind of stuff that you can work out sometimes in, in the thumbnails. Okay. Mm. Makes sense. Mm. So in regards to... so. Sorry, go on. It's a kind of planning stage, really. Yeah. Okay. So then you'd, you'd go on to... Well, I'm, I'm figuring this in my head. So then would you... And this is me just trying to understand it fully. Would you then... Once you've done that that planning, you then know how you want each of the frames to go on a page? That would lead to that? Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the older I've got and the more comics I've drawn, my storytelling has sort of simplified so i don't tend to to go in for the the wackiest storytelling that i think that i might have tried uh when i first started so i do tend to um keep things in more simple square boxes Mm -hmm. so my my storytelling is usually uh governed by 
uh, I want the reader's eye to comfortably move across the page, you know, very easily where it's supposed to be going next and hopefully have some sort of flow to the page that you just naturally know where you're going to read. So even in the six panel, say it's six squares, mm -hmm. there are ways that you can very subtly, you know, encourage somebody to then go down to the next row. It might just be, you know, um, I don't know, the, the tail of a dragon or just some sort of subtle hints. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that, you know, um, in terms of, what goes in a box I, I tend to keep it sort of uh, simple in my um panel design but try and put as much as i can inside it really and then the staging it's as much down to what you're comfortable with as an artist i know sometimes if i am having trouble you know getting a certain angle then keeping it simple is you know is is always a a, a good way to go and you know and don't try and be i suppose too flashy um don't worry about um making things look you know too <laughs> um hollywood mm -hmm. <laughs> i suppose but, <clears throat> i mean that thumbnail stage then enables you i suppose to just consider all these things quite quickly um with some quite sort of small scribbles sometimes and then once you've got those, sometimes you can just literally blow those small scribbles then back up from your small little um, scamps on your, um, on your paper. Mm. And then they give you the rough outlines that you might then, you know, um, go to the next stage, which is, you know, pencils, which is when you would more fill out. That's where your drawing ability would come in more, mm -hmm. where you'd fill out your figures where you'd put some more of the, the backgrounds in, you'd consider yeah. um, your lighting. Um, and that's where, you know, your character work, I suppose, is going to come in, your figure work, mm -hmm. getting the emotion into, the, uh, in a, into a particular scene or getting some um, exaggeration into the poses, making it, you know, flow. Okay, and the next, I suppose, then eventually get onto the, which is another bit of challenge in my mind, is, is the wording and the word balloons, which you said about yes, the, 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 no. the placement of them, I understand, you know, like you say, left yeah. to right, up, down. But I suppose it's his designer's choice, isn't it? Do you then stick it on a computer and, and, and do them that way? Or would you hand draw it, hand write it? Or is, is it all dependent on what you want to do as a creator? What, what do you find is the best way? Yeah. Yeah, it depends what you're comfy with. The very first comic I did, um, I did in perhaps the traditional style that everyone's first comic, especially as a kid, you would just draw <laughs> everything. You didn't know. You drew a box, you drew a man in it, and then you drew the word balloon, and then you put your text yeah. in. And, <laughs> and then have it coming that, off the side of the balloon. So you have your balloon big enough. <laughs> yeah, you'd have it literally touching his lips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and there are um, professional comic artists that still still do it that way. I mean, um, one of my favourites all time, um, um, comic god Jaime Hernandez of Love and Rockets, um, he draws everything on the page, mm. and including the the word balloons and including the text, you know, uh, within it. Um, it's it's not uh, it's a completely viable way to do it. Um, because I've got the kit that I require as a designer and an illustrator, and because my handwriting's horrible, <laughs> I tend to drop my um, lettering on um, in a program called um, Illustrator, mm. which allows me to control the exact size of the word balloons, um, keeps them nice and crisp. You can repeat them, use the shapes again, um, type the text out. Um, but you know, you could do it straight into Photoshop. I mean, the important thing about lettering is, uh, considering it at the right stage as well. I tend to letter my, um, comics before they're inked just to make sure that I've left the right amount of space and I yeah. can move things around or just readjust things. 
um, because getting the right amount of text or leaving the right amount of space in a panel for the text of a word balloon can be tricky. Mm-hmm. So having you know having that little bit of um, uh, wiggle room to change the contents of your panel before it's nailed down to inks is is handy. But yes, it, that would, this was one of the things I remember having the most conversations with really in the in the SEC with um, with the creators was because you know lots of people can. Um, write or they'd written something before and lots of people had drawn drawn something before and then drawn their own comics but there was this um because you're used to seeing it done in a certain way you kind of think it has to be done that way Mm. um and it and it doesn't i think you i think it's it's really nice sometimes for the artist to produce the lettering themselves because they've done the art and then it kind of just organically looks right Mm. if they've produced the lettering as well you've got good handwriting so, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it makes it easier for me if you Doesn't do that just <laughs> yeah you know you could um what else could you do you could do uh acetate you could oh, do um did you, you're there, do there. yeah it's, it's there, doing your... animation style you know you could put a blob some white paint over it and then just write on that with a the sharpie <laughs> you could do it straight onto the straight onto the artwork um i mean i suppose eventually we're going to come to how this gets output um but somewhere along the line nowadays you probably are going to have to put it on a computer mm. and i yeah. think your choices, your choices nowadays would be um photoshop or probably um clip studio um, Microsoft Paint what was you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just no, so it wouldn't. It's awful. <laughs> I've got clips. Yeah. Yes, we've got clips. We've got clips. Yeah. I'm sure somebody's done a comic. <laughs> I'm feeling this is the way forward for it. Microsoft Paint for the win. <laughs> but um, if you you are eventually going to send it off to uh, a printers, and they will expect it in a certain format. So there will be certain um, professional standards that you'll need to learn. Um, and these two programs will allow you to send it to them in in the way that they will require it. Photoshop, um, it's about, te- well, it's a monthly fee now. Yeah. Rather than buying, buying the program outright, it's, I think it's about £10 a month if you just want Photoshop. Mm-hmm. And then Manga and Clip Studio, you can still just buy that outright. Really and that's about yeah. £70. There's two versions. I'm not quite sure what the difference is. Um, but I'm pretty sure just the £70 one, you can do everything you need to do to get your comic ready and out. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but that, again, that's if you, you know, uh, in terms of lettering, they would both allow you to do your lettering still in any any fashion you could still paint it on and handwrite it on the screen if you wanted to um they've both got um text ability so you know they'll both allow you to type your text in and and change the fonts um oh and actually massive resource for lettering there's um a website called blambot which is run by um nate um picos picos Mm -hmm who's um amazing letterer and a huge supporter of um small and independent um comic creators he has a wealth of um fonts on his website uh, blambot that are free to download and free to use uh, you get a free license as an independent comic creator um to use them in your um Independent comics, okay. which, yeah. it's, and it's it's amazing resource. I mean, we'll, uh, we'll get on the notes. Yeah, yeah, he's a brilliant letter anyway. I mean, he does Umbrella Academy, and he's done lots of work for for DC and Marvel and Dark Horse. Um, so, so I think it's it's amazing that he's done that. But as a, you know, as a as a comic creator, I, I find it uh, really useful. Mm. So. But, so, yeah, so if you consider the lettering at 
at your pencil stage. Mm-hmm. Traditionally, the next stage then would be either inks or, you know, you might be doing a painted comic. Yeah. So you might be just going into straight onto the, um, straight into the colours. But um, uh, perhaps a more standard industry approach would be inks, uh, which is just when you're tightening up your lines. Uh, it was really introduced because printing techniques weren't very good back in the day mm. and pencils wouldn't show up so you needed a stronger line so nowadays you can actually um lots of artists will take their pencils directly to to the finish stage and um usually get tightened up digitally um but they're, they're, it's really there just to give your uh, line work a bit of power and punch so that it gets produced uh, properly and gets reproduced properly um and then it would be letters, um, as we just discussed. Yeah. Okay, so that side of things, as far as the the, the colouring and line, you, you you do that mm-hmm. anyway. So mm-hmm. that that that's sorted. So let's say we manage to actually create a comic of however many pages. Or yep. four, four pages. pages that'll yeah, do. Pages. Um, <laughs> how do you then? What's the process then of essentially pulling it together with a cover, a back? Mm-hmm. And then sending yeah. it, as you say, off to a printer or wherever it requires to go. Yeah. See, this this is the this is the nerdy bit I really like. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is the bit that I usually uh, do get involved in because this is the production essentially. Mm-hmm. This is the this is the I suppose the least known side of it because lots of artists, professional artists, probably you know they just send it off and. It's it's all part of a of a process. I suppose it's only when you know you end up doing the whole thing from start to finish that you normally find out what what happens then. But in ter- in terms of production, you this is where I was talking about really about knowing some f- some terminology that your printer will expect you to understand. So when you um, choose a printer um, and I, I suppose the two most well-known small press comic printers in the UK. Um, there are more uh, available, but in terms of the of the two that um, if, I think, if you walk around any con, the two um, printers that would have produced the majority of of the work in the room would be uh, UK Comics Creative UK and Comic Printing mm-hmm. uh, UK, and um they will be more than happy to help you um if especially if they know it's your first time um we've used uh stuart at uk comics creative pretty much exclusively for most of the scc stuff and most of um my stuff uh the four it really boils down to four main things that they would ex- uh, any printer would expect you to know about um, the color that you supply your artwork in is in a format called CMYK. So uh, if you think of when you buy ink for your home printer, mm. you buy it in usually cyan, yellow, yeah. magenta, or black. Yeah. Um, if you take well, it's cheapest, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you don't buy it in red, green, blue. Uh, if you take a photo on a, a digital camera on your phone, it automatically will take it in um, RGB format. Yeah. So they're the two main formats of, of files. Um, pro- to be professionally printed by a printer, it just needs to be changed into CMYK format, um, which you would do in one of the programs we mentioned earlier. Uh, I, I get you could definitely do it in Photoshop, which is the one I use. Um, I'm not really, I have got a copy of Clip Studio, but I've just not really used it because I'm mm-hmm. so used to Photoshop. But I would um, I would use um, a Photoshop to change my files into CMYK or I would be working in them natively as I produce them. Um, resolution. So that is the detail that, the work you're sending off to the printer needs to be in. Yeah. So typically, you know, uh, 
on a camera, you would be given uh, megapixels. So it would be, you know, so many thousand megapixels, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure what the um, maths behind it is, but you can work out what the um, <clears throat> excuse me, what the uh, print resolution would be, which is normally defined in dots per inch. Um, the the minimum you would want to send a printer is uh, 300 dots per inch, which um, this would become important when you were scanning your artwork in, for instance. Or right. give, somebody else to scan in and they would want to know what your minimum or maximum is Mm -hmm. um you might even take a picture i suppose um if you've got a good enough um camera and your hand steady enough uh but traditionally you would you would have your artwork scanned in Mm -hmm. um there's something called um bleed yeah which is uh the small amount of artwork you have to produce that goes beyond the size of the page you want so that when it's trimmed, you don't end up with a little white line. Mm -hmm. It will just trim off a certain portion of your artwork to ensure you have um, artwork going all the way to the edge of your page. That's if you're not doing a frame. That's more for your front cover and stuff, isn't it, more the case? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There'll be some part of your comic probably that you'll need it for yeah whether it's even you know that you want a full color on your inside front cover you want you know um it, your standard comic if it has got a white white frame all the re- way around it it's not going to be needed but it'll still be a word that your printer will you know mention to you yeah you know, has it got any bleed so that's what that means and then the format that you're supplying it in so nowadays you would uh, a printer would probably want either a PDF or a JPEG. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Both of those formats will give you some um, quality uh, options when you save. So uh, a PDF would normally ask if you want it, you know, uh, screen quality or high quality or press quality. And press quality would be the one you'd want to go for. And then a JPEG. Again, um, you'd need to know the resolution properly, um, making sure the physical size of of, of these uh, images is adequate to um, give the printer the detail you want. You know, I, I'm a member of a Facebook group of uh, comic uh, creatives, and you know, lots of times you'll just get the odd post about people saying, "Oh, you know, my." I've just got it back from the printers and it's a bit fuzzy. Does anyone realize, you know, why? Mm-hmm. And usually it's because you've been dealing with a printer who's not been nice enough to explain ahead of time what, you know, what you should be aiming for. But, um, it, you know, it, it's, you only have to get to grips with it once, really. And, and all printers would be happy to explain, you know, what it is. So don't, don't feel that um, they're not going to... Uh, all, Again, if it's uh, if it's a smaller uh, printers, and you're dealing with one or two guys there, then they'll be happy to. But if you are going, for instance, down the A5 route, then there are some really good online printers. And then in that case, you're you're not dealing with a guy on the end of a phone. Yeah. You're, you're just dealing with you know an online resource, and they expect you to throw the files up, and then they get printed. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the time, they're even you know checked automatically. Uh, and if you if, you know that you can get a, a very good deal using that, but once again, you're not going to have somebody you know helping you out. Or if it gets printed wrong, then you know they'll have said, "Well, we did make it very clear before you uploaded what." Yeah, the- yeah, it's yeah. your own fault. So um, you know that's. So we'll just send it to Pete to sort out. Yeah, yeah. We'll just we'll just send it to Pete, <laughs> and then, then he can sort it out. Because I've been writing all this down like a good girl doing her GCSEs. Here. Well, <laughs> I don't I don't want to frighten anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've just li- done a little doodle here, and it's me just going help. So everybody send comments to everyone. Send to me. Is he yeah. willing to? Yeah, Pete will do it. Everybody's. <laughs> but you know, um, it's. Yeah, and, and it's funny, it's that's you know, that's your inside front cover, you know, it's your you know, you might have your title page, mm-hmm. um, your credit page, mm-hmm. you know, the, the the bit at the end about the authors, back matter, um, coming soon. 
And that's the production side. It's also making sure you've got the right amount of pages as well because you, you need to supply in multiples of uh, four to ensure that you've got the right amount of pages, obviously, yeah. because they, they'll, they'll print them in folded sections. Of course, yeah. Yeah, they're staple. So you've got to make sure that your, your inside uh, internal pages are multiples yeah. of four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, all, it's all just little things like that. Okay, so you, so so you get that parcel through your door of your printed comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you get people to read the damn things? We're going to throw them at them. Now there's a challenge, isn't Attached it? Now, to a brick you, you've the you've um, obviously gone through Kickstarter with your latest or the SEC's latest comic. Yeah. Have you, yeah. Did you find that was obviously it was very useful because you, you got funded and you got the money you needed? But was it a challenge? Did you feel, or did it, was it? Did it run itself? Well, this this is the bit that I find the hardest. So you know, this is the bit that gets me stumped. I'm, I'm you know, I'm sure that for me, it's my everyday bread and butter to deal mm. with the production and to deal with certain aspects of artwork. And but to get somebody to read it and to deal with essentially what Kickstarter gave us was a marketing task and you know some would say you know opportunity but it was you know it was a bit of a bit of both it gives you extra work to do on top of the production of the comic you've got to make sure you know that you're updated you've got to make sure that you're organized we just would not have been able to print the comic without the kickstarter it's just as simple as that so it was kind of taken out of our hands whether we did it or not we were really chuffed that we got backed um and it, you know, it's not just, um, well, it's it's not even mainly local people. It's just the great thing about Kickstarter is you put something out there and people who are interested, you know, get involved yeah. and support it. So, so it was really nice to perhaps reach perhaps, you know, one of the biggest markets we had really by putting ourselves on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, then getting people to read it, then that is something that... Um, I, I suppose I know how to do all this other bit, so I always I always choose to do that over the, <laughs> the <sun. laughs> I always choose this. Oh well, I can do this, so you know, let, I'll, I'll link my pages, and then you know, slowly but surely, uh, you you you'll see somebody else doing it, or you know, you'll 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 meet the Etheringtons, and you'll <laughs> you know, you'll you'll, you'll watch, cry. But, yeah, you'll watch what they do with their social media or, you know, you'll meet other um, artists and teams at cons, which I think when we first started out, when I first started out, I, I thought, um, you know, the main use of cons was to go there and put your thing on the table and sell it. And of course, that's important. But going there and meeting other people and uh, hearing what they do or how they do it differently or, you know, um, what successes and problems they've had or, you know, what printers they've used mm-hmm. or that really makes the the trips to cons invaluable. Just, you know, meeting and, um, and, and sharing the way to do things. I think that's, the, that has become my favorite part of going to festivals and conventions now is you know it's great to sit behind the table and see people buy your stuff and read it but also to to meet your peers and fellow creators um it it it, it it's just becoming valuable really and you know I've learned a, a huge amount from from everybody that I've met and, and spoke to really on so, both sides of the table so since it's been a year since you've done this properly um, mm. you, you come on the show. You, you don't promote your own work, so you've got your op- your chance now. <laughs> <laughs> what you're selling? <laughs> what can people buy from Pete Taylor? And what's coming out this year? Well, funnily enough, this is how bad I am. At my <laughs> well, I, I've just got a table at Thought Bubble in t- 2018. Hopefully, we'll be there. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, can't wait. It'd be be superb. But I was there last year. So, um, 
each each year you know i kind of learn that bit more so this time around um my application they suggested you know that they wanted to see um what your online uh, what your online sort of face was yeah mine wasn't very good so just after christmas i did spend a bit of time trying to smarten myself up <laughs> online <laughs> so i revisited my my blog and just tidied that up but then i set up a i set up a, a shop as well okay yeah so i've got um this pete dot uh dot com and that's where i've got all of my available um work at the moment so i've got my i've just got the rights back to monster kids yeah. so we can now review that we need yeah. to review that we've been waiting for that <laughs> yeah you got you got the uh i did a short run of uh preview copies to to hand out yeah. um, to uh, publishers and reviewers, uh, so there's some preview copies of of that on online. I'm intending to do um, a, a sort of bigger version uh, later down the line with because uh, I've got lots of little strips and backup um, extras that I want to put into the actual thing. But for the moment, the preview is, uh, copy is up there. A pound from every sale. Is going to Dementia UK as well, so it's a it's a worthy buy. Mm. I've got my sketch card book up there, hundred sketch cards, which is just sort of random um, commissions and pictures I've done for people, and that covers sort of pop culture and comics and uh, just weirdness. <laughs> uh, my very first comic, which I mentioned tonight, that I drew from scratch, including all of the uh, texting and stuff. It was my um, a story about one of my first characters called Mike Wednesday. Um, that's that's on there. Uh, a Copperopolis, mm-hmm. and then there's prints and a little mini comic that I worked on with um, my daughter Nancy, which is only I think eight pages long. <laughs> oh, mate. Like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, eight sounds fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely fine. You just call it a mini comic. <laughs> and, you, and you sell it for a lot less than your bigger comic. <laughs> I did have a mini comic and a bigger mini comic the first time I came to Lakes as well. So, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, there's a few badges, prints. Uh, you can get a commission on there as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's all That's all my stuff. But I just find it difficult. I, I just find it difficult to, to then go, hey, I got a shop, you know. <laughs> That's why know. you have publishers. Let's be honest. I don't know how to quite get it in my in my Twitter and still feel, you know, not feel a little bit weird afterwards, yeah. you know. So uh, just pimp it. it, pimp it. No, it's not that easy. I know. I know. You just got to be a bit clever, but you just pimp it. <laughs> well, I sit there and I, I obsess over what I'm going to write and what I'm going to tweet, and then in the end, it's like, oh, actually, I've got this page to finish. I'll just finish that. Yeah, page. yeah, sounds fine. <laughs> so it, 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 there's always work, so I always end up kind of forgetting to do it. But um, yeah, I, 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 I will. <laughs> but yeah, and that's the bit. Hopefully, I'm most excited to learn about in in this project is you know um i can help everybody in the in the start in the production in the um in the finishing mm. what happens then that's my area of interest in this so i'm going to be as excited <laughs> As, as you two to learn how to sell your comic after it. Yeah. We've got to finish it first. Let's not rush the <laughs> Well, oh, that's bound to happen. It started now. There's there's no stopping it. Well, just, as, as soon as I sent an email to Julie Tate, the, the festival director, I couldn't. We could not then do it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks. No, it's going to be like that boulder at the beginning of Raiders. And oh. it sort of is, also gives us deadline it's really. Running in front of it. <laughs> Just me just yeah, scrabbling. <laughs> really, a deadline. We need to have it done by July, really. That's, that's oh, right, of, July, is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. What, so where do you want What do you want it printed? You're going you're to release it at... Uh, if we're successful. <laughs> the <laughs> idea would be at the lakes, yes. Yes. For charity. For charity. For charity, mate. Depending on your size, you can go a little longer than July. Thank I you. Think just depends i mean and there's always there, there are all, always i think um, there's always ways but i mean part of the problem i've had with 
the Monster Kids is because it was done digitally for uh, a digital comic online, it's landscape. Mm -hmm. So the pages themselves, if I try to move it to a US comic, it's going to be really quite expensive to print. I I wanted a a slightly bigger version than A5. That's why the previews are A5. So I'm trying to work out how to make it bigger, Mm. yet still be (laughs) achievable to print and and affordable. And they're not too expensive that people, you know, because you want to make your money back as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's so important to kind of, you know, bear that in mind at the beginning, because you would know uh, how quickly you can turn it around. So if your size is A5, um, then you can get you know really quite fast turnarounds. Okay, uh, especially if, if you're doing if you're doing a short run on um, of digital. You know, I think there are even some places online that would um, you know claim to be able to give it you next day. It's the print. It's the print. Ten percent off voucher. There's a few. I've had some really, really you know good options. Well, I mean the flyers that we did for the yeah, the, they're really good. You know, I mean, and and that's from a company called Hello Print. Hello Print, Print yeah. Great, mm-hmm. it, you know? Bargain price. Yeah, but good quality as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, and, and always, always, always check and then check and check again. Because I did a, um, the little mini comic I'd mentioned earlier, the, the Monster Kid mini comic I did for Nancy. I did that for last year's Thought Bubble. And there was a small problem that they flagged up which I fixed, and then I resent the PDF. I was so excited, opened it all up, went through it, looks great, uh, you know, really chuffed with the colours, and then I realised the word balloons from the middle spread were missing. <gasps> yeah. So uh, I think I had 150. <laughs> so I've, I bought some sticker paper, <laughs> <laughs> printed out the balloons, and I've yes, I think I've done about um, I think I've done about seventy five. But I've got half a half that's a genius, mm. genius way to solve it. <laughs> I'm making a <Yeah>. note. <laughs> a lot of work though that I could. Well, yes, that's <laughs> true. That's very true. I just checked. <laughs> Pete, that's been brilliant. Thank you very much. You know, we'll be hassling you as we go along. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it's not a hassle. Like I say, I'm, I, I do love this stuff. I can't help it. You know, it, and it's my bread and butter. So you know, I understand people get confused by this. So I'm happy to help anybody who's listening. And of course, I'm at your at the pod boss's beck and call. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pete. Yeah, no, it's great to chat. The Lakes International Comic Art Festival will be back! Book the date in your diary, the 12th to the 14th of October 2018, and stay up to date with all the latest at comicartfestival.com. So we now know how to uh, make a comic. Uh-huh. So how far have we got making this comic? I've, I've sketched out the first page, mister. So I've, I've written down a few things. You haven't re- I have not seen evidence of this writing. I will show you after. I have got oh, it. I have, oh, have, I, you? I am, have I've you got done ideas. It? You? Oh, oh, the ideas, oh. man. We're in this mess because you had an idea. This is why we should not leave you alone at work with at any time to by, yourself. By the next episode, I will have written down at least a quarter to half of the comic. A quarter to half? Oh, right. So now we're just going to put the pressure on me. Well, yeah. <laughs> Once I've done my bit. Oh, that's it. You just swan off then, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Take the money and run. <laughs> what money? <laughs> All the money. <laughs> so, I think we've still got a lot to learn. You, you think? A lot to learn. <laughs> but we're, the, we're on the way. We're on the journey. Okay, we'll do that. We're on a journey. On, I was going to say, we're on, on the, the way. No, I've on, literally not, sketched out one A4 we're page. We're on the journey. The, the journey. Not the even a journey. Journey. The journey. To enlightenment. To, to what? To <laughs> Anyway, let's move on. So we'll have more about that next time because we will have actual content that we will have created. Will we? I will have. Oh, God. I will. I will. Okay. Um, We've got some festival news. (gasps) Bring it on. starting. Oh. The festival news is beginning. I'm getting butterflies just thinking Um, about it. We are in 2018. I know. Which means... We've got the countdown. It's starting. Yes. It's quite a while to go yet, though. It 
isn't. It's only nine months away. Only. That is not many. You could have you could get pregnant now and have a baby in time. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> So, the festival has a new festival patron. <gasps> Who, you might ask? Who? Who is this person? Uh, Zoom Rockman. He's, like, young. I was going to say, he is young, isn't he? He's, like, really young. He's, like, like... Is He's, there... like, young, young, young. Yeah. That's good. Young blood. Uh, so, we chatted to him at the festival mm-hmm. last year as a recording of us having a chat. Yes. Or me having a chat. I was going to say, yeah. Was, I was... doing stuff. <laughs> I was corralling children. <laughs> um, He's a... British satirist, satirist, I can never say words. Satirist. <laughs> That's the one. Whose comic strip, <laughs> Skanky Pigeon, first appeared in the Beano when he was 12. Um, age he had 16, plushy pigeons on his thing, he? Didn't became he? the youngest cartoonist in a private eye magazine history, which is just... Amazing. You don't expect no. teenagers to have even heard of private eye, never mind. Yeah. To actually, you know. Um, so he's a major rising star within the, the oh, comics yeah. world. Um and the fact he's doing political stuff, you can see him growing, growing yeah. any way he wants almost. Mm. So he's become a patron. Um, we'll see what he does come the yes, festival because obviously yeah. patrons have always done, been involved in many ways. Yeah. And, and so we'll we'll see what he, what he's going to do. So yeah, interesting. He's coming on the show as well, at some point. Brilliant. When I book it, <laughs> does help. We've agreed. Yeah, it's coming on, but I don't, I've just not actually <laughs> physically agreed a date yet. So he'll be coming on for a chat and we'll, we'll find out more, more about him. More about him, yes. Uh, there is... <sighs> I'm not good at names. Oh, if you've Fumio got another Abata. one. Oh, you know him. Do, it's fine. <laughs> um, Palm of the Unknown, which was displayed at the festival last that year. That was gorgeous. That's back up again. It's in Whitehaven, um, running until 25th of March. So... If you're up north, north, mm. not just north here, this but, is north, north, uh, go and have a <laughs> look north. at the Beacon Museum mm. in Whitehaven. So it's well worth having a nosy. Oh, yeah, definitely. That. Finally. Yes. A new anthology. You can't giggle already with, because people with, won't know why you're giggling. We've recorded this before uh-huh. and decided Yesterday, to delete Yesterday, in fact. It. Um, because. <laughs> because why, Ian? What? Because tell, I tried tell reading. Why. Yes, you did. Names. And things I couldn't read. And, and I'm, I'm surprised you can read. So <laughs> Everyone's surprised. This is take four, five. T five. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, the Lakes has joined forces with Anna Marche Celebel. Why, why the accent? I don't know. Okay. Uh, to create an international anthology of 18 short stories by leading comic creators. Mm-hmm. Um, and graphic novelists. And it will be launched in France and the UK. In Ooh. October of this year. Well, I do like a joint release. It's good, isn't it? Uh, the commission stories will reflect on the impact that World War One still has in the world today. Mm. The project called Traces of the Great War is a part of the wider 14 to 18 national program that launches in London on the 22nd of January. Just gone. Yes, yes. Because um, it's the centenary, isn't it, basically? The Lakes is commissioning seven to eight stories. Mm-hmm. And basically, obviously, they've probably all decided in the, the exact number now, but this is me reading from yeah. that past email. Mm-hmm. Um, with some creators like Dave McKean, mm-hmm. um, Simon Armitage. There was also, let me bring up the full list. Here we go. Charlie Adlard, mm-hmm. uh, ignoring the French ones because I can't read them. Sean Phillips, mm-hmm. Ian Rankin. I know, I'm very excited <laughs> about that one. Robbie Morrison, Brian Talbot, Mary Talbot, amongst many. Now, obviously, we want to get some of these on the show. Yes. Uh, we'd love to get them in pairs. Well, if, if not, then individually. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, Is this the Sean Phillips Ian Ranking pairing? We that want we, either we that want, or yeah. Ian Ranking. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, you're extra on this one. <laughs> no, we'd love to get some of those guys on to, to talk about mm. this project and to see how it comes out in the end, because I'm sure it's going to be... It's as, an important as, piece. As with all Lakes projects, mm. they always seem to come out an amazing product yeah so that'll be released back at the festival or close to the festival but certainly going to be available at the festival yeah so yeah really exciting Mm. so news is coming from the festival it's great um so there we go we've recorded that again (laughs) it sounded better this time (laughs) well it had more gravitas this time which is what we lacked on the first time seriously with you trying to do French bits. Um, we might be on another podcast soon. 
Oh yes. Yes. Um it's it's a different style. Mm. It's called Dem Drunk Blokes. I think that sums it up really. That sums it, it up. <laughs> um they're, they're thinking of coming up to see us at the lakes as well. Yes, yeah. Are we moving? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hopefully next episode we'll have the awesome comic podcast mm-hmm. guys on board to talk about their new anthology comic and we'll talk a little bit more about our comic yes and the usual <laughs> I, I got my sketchbook out today actually i mean i hadn't got it out yesterday but i got it out today <laughs> and it was a bit of a worry when i looked at it and thought ah. it'll be fine it'll be fine it'll be fine it'll be fine thank you very much for listening thank you i will see you next week. Thank you for listening. Find out more about the festival at comicartfestival.com. Find out more about the show and how to contact us at comicartpodcast.uk. Find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Music composed by Pop Noir. This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. <laughs>